Well, let me greet all of our locations that are joining us right now and just say welcome, whether you're in one of our seven campuses around Tampa Bay or joining us online, we're glad that you're with us today. It's a really special day, um, not just because you're here, which that is a big deal, but it is a special day because at the end of the service, we're going to do something, um, we're going to change it up a bit. So at the end of the service, we're going to end early so that we can um, celebrate people getting baptized today. It's a big deal. Across Tampa Bay, there's 100 plus people getting baptized today. To God be the glory. 100 plus people. Let us never take that lightly, that these are lives being transformed. And uh, even in, in, just in the earlier service today, a guy today I gave my life to Jesus today I did I walked out got dressed got baptized happening in your church today that's a big deal so I say that to say there's gonna be people when I release at the end of this service that God stirs your heart and this is gonna be your decision-making day this is gonna be your day you're going you know what I'm going all in and, and maybe you made some decision when you're younger or maybe you're sprinkled as a baby or whatever it is but you, you're making a decision today, you're going, I'm going all in with Jesus. I'm finally going public with my faith. And if that's you, at the end of this service, I'm going to release. And when I release you, even though you didn't come prepared, we came prepared for you. We got t-shirts and shorts and, and we got towels and everything you need to get baptized today. So if God stirs your heart, why don't you do that? And I believe it'll be a decision you will never regret. Amen? Amen. Fist bump your neighbor. You can be seated all across Tampa Bay. Well, I'm so glad that you're at church today. My name is Aaron Burke, and I am the lead pastor here at Radiant Church, one church in seven locations. And on behalf of my wife and I, we're just so pumped that you are here. We are in part two of a sermon series we are doing on health. We've been talking about health all year long, and we've talked about your, your uh, spiritual health and your financial health, relational health, mental health, and now we're dealing with health in your heart. And I started this series last week. It's called The Heart of Things, The Heart of Things. And we're dealing with all issues in our heart. And our heart needs to be transformed, needs to get better. And the Bible is packed full of references on the heart. You can find them right there in your sermon notes. We are a note-taking church, so follow right along. There's over 633 references just in the Old Testament dealing with issues of your heart. Your heart really matters. And then the New Testament follows it up with another 170 references just in the New Testament about our heart. Your heart really matters. The condition of your heart, what you allow in your heart, really matters. Proverbs 27 says it this way, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the, what? Shout it out loud. It reflects the heart. So if your life is chaotic, it's because your heart is chaotic. If your life is filled with drama, it's because your heart is filled with drama. If your life is, is a little bit out of order, it's probably because your heart is out of order. If your life is sick, it's because your heart is sick. So let's get our heart right. And last week, I started this series talking about the issue of bitterness in our heart. And I'm telling you, the response was overwhelming from people who have said, man, there's bitterness deep in my heart. If you missed it, check out the message on YouTube. But today, I want to take it another step forward because I really believe this is going to be a subject that's going to heal a lot of people today. And I want to talk to you today for a few minutes about a broken heart, a broken heart. What do you do when your heart is broken? You, you can probably remember your first time experiencing heartbreak. Maybe it was that middle school romance that you had or, or that, that person that, you know, that, that left you or whatever the situation was. I remember my first time experiencing heartache. Um, it was in sixth grade, and it was when my dog died. I'm telling you, I love this dog. And so if you're a dog owner, you know the feeling of like, these aren't just dogs. These are like family members. So cat owners, you don't understand this. But dog owners, you get this. You get this idea. And I remember coming to school that day, and I was so broken. I was so sad that my dog died, and my teacher was like, Aaron, are you okay? And, and I couldn't even talk. I remember it was like ugly cry. I was like, ah, ah, my dog. And he said so the whole class was like, you know, trying to console me, but they are also like laughing at me. And I, I'll never forget, it was a few years back, I went back to my hometown where I'm from, and, and I remember walking through the mall, and a guy came up to me that was in that class, and he says, Aaron, I remember you. We were in sixth grade together. You were that weirdo that cried in the class. I was like, you're a bully, and you're mean, so... <laughs> But heartache and heartbreak comes in all shapes and sizes. Man, 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 and it's very real in our world today. Maybe you prayed for someone and you really believed for a healing and it didn't happen. 
The marriage you thought would thrive, it, it, it separated. The, the job or, or the initiative you, you thought it was going to really work out and, and it ended. I, I just really believe that there's people coming to church today that have experienced some brokenness in their heart. And I want you to know, I think we're experiencing it now more than maybe ever before. It was about a month ago that the Lord gave me this message. I wrote this message a month ago having no clue why he wanted me to preach it on this weekend, the last weekend in May of 2022. And as I was preparing, I was like, God, it just doesn't even make sense. And, and then we go into this week, and haven't we experienced a week of brokenness? Yeah. I mean, even just this last week, we, we saw a, a, a massacre of children in the school. And, and, and even seeing that, Katie and I are just crying, just thinking about our own kids, thinking about those families. And what happens? Your heart is broken. And then, and then you deal with this stuff that's going on in the world. It's hard to even look at the news out there today. Because you watch it and you're just, your heart is, is broken. Broken for what's going on in Europe. Broken for what's happening in our own country. Broken for what is going on in your own lives. Then I think about our own church family. People we love so dearly and dealing with cancer diagnosis and, and struggles in their family and, and, and marriages splitting apart. And I'm just walking in today with brokenness in my heart. And the world has a way of doing that to you. So what do we do with our broken heart? I, I want to give you a little illustration. You know, last week I, I, I threw money out at everybody. So a lot of people sat this week on the front row thinking, we're getting money this week. Ain't no more money this week. Now you get shards of glass in your eyes. So <laughs> you didn't make the wisest decision right here. But what happens in our world today is that our world is filled with so much turmoil and so much hurt and so much chaos. And it just beats at you and beats at you and beats at you. And eventually, that's what happens. Eventually, you find yourself in a place where it is just completely in shambles. What do you do when your life is broken. Proverbs tells us this way. He says, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit, look what it does. It saps a person's strength. Isn't that true? Like, have you ever had a broken heart and what your strength is sapped? You feel like I can't even go on. I feel drained. I feel exhausted. That's how some of you feel right now in our world. And I'm going to teach you what to do when your heart is broken and you feel like you can't Go on. I'm going to give you a story today in the book of John chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your notes, I want you to take them out and follow along with me because you're going to see two ladies in our story who are dealing with a broken heart. Their names are Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, they're prominent figures in the Bible that you see throughout the New Testament in Jesus' life. They're very involved in Jesus' ministry. And they had a brother by the name of Lazarus. Say Lazarus. Now, you got to follow this story for a little bit because Lazarus and Mary and Martha are very close to Jesus. Now, if Jesus is your close friend. How many know you don't have a lot to worry about? Like, you have a problem, you need money, you go to Jesus. He's got it taken care of. You're sick of your body, you go to Jesus. Or you want to walk on water? You go to Jesus. Like, you, gotta, you need more food? He'll multiply food for you. Jesus is a good friend to have. And Mary and Martha send word to Jesus because their, their brother Lazarus is now sick in his body. And they send word to, to Jesus, and as they send word to Jesus, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, we'll go in a little bit. We'll, we'll eventually get around to it. I don't know about you, but I don't like not being the priority for Jesus. You know what I mean? I, I want to be his, like, number one priority. I want to be like, when, when I call, like, he immediately works on the scenes. But that's, that's not what happened in our story, and Lazarus continues to get more and more sick, and as he gets more and more sick, eventually, and we don't know the timeline of it, but eventually Lazarus dies. Mary and Martha are frustrated. The miracle worker never came, and now Lazarus is dead, and he's not just dead for a day or two days or three days, but now we pick up on the story, and Jesus finally arrives on the scene, John Chapter 11, and I want you to see it in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. How many days? Four days. Four days. This is, this is a scenario. you got to think that four days in, four days in, they've been grieving. They've been mourning. Let's be honest. 
they're probably a little bitter. They're probably a little frustrated. They're a little sad. Their heart is broken because Lazarus is dead. And in the midst of this, they have a decision to make. They hear that Jesus is now on the scene. Now, I don't know about you, but I get frustrated when Jesus comes on the scene sometimes after I needed him. He he comes for everybody else, but what about for me at times? And Mary and Martha are sitting there in their home, and word comes, well, Jesus is here. Well, when Jesus shows up, you know, they're probably sitting there talking, and they're going, well, where was he five days ago? Come on, you ever, ever had a moment where you go, where was Jesus then? You know, your friend prays and gets healed of a headache, like, immediately. And I've been praying for something for years. Come on, Jesus, where are you at? What do we do when our heart is broken? Let me show you what you do. The Bible says in verse 20 what happens next. And it says, when Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But look what happens. But Mary stayed at home. Two responses to a broken heart. One goes out to meet Jesus. One stays at home. Here's number one. Write down your notes. When you deal with a broken heart, you can sit in your brokenness or you can surrender your brokenness to Jesus. You can surrender it to Jesus. I I think at times we have to make a decision. Are we going to be a Mary or are we going to be a Martha? A Martha says, I'm broken, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, but I'm going to take that brokenness and I'm going to bring it to Jesus. And Mary's sitting at home going, well, you know, if he wants to see me, he can come and see me himself. I'm going to stay in here. I, I, I want you to know you fall into one of these two categories. So let me help you figure out what category you fall into. And I'm going to use a very practical illustration to help us along with this. Because I think there's two types of people in the world. And you're one of these two types of people. And I'm going to help you with a very um, understanding illustration. Okay? So the first type of, of people that are in our audience today are those that get gas when it looks like this. Now, where are my people that it gets around there and you're like, it's time to get gas. Come on, where are you at? Where are you at? That's weird to me. That's weird to me. I I don't get people like this. Come on. It doesn't make sense, especially not in today's culture. Come on, we got to get every bit of gas that we can out of that tank. But then there's another group of people. You're like me. Where are my people that start to think I might need to go to a gas station when it looks like this? Come on, where are you at? (laughs) <laughs> come on I, I know you're at heights come on I know you are North Tampa I know that's you come on St. Pete there's nobody raising their hand they're all like no they're sophisticated there at St. Pete there, there's a group of people you look at that and you go I can I can get 20 more miles out of this thing I can get 20 more miles <laughs> I saw this meme the other day I thought it was pretty funny it, it, it says like this this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine come on church joke for you it's the same when it comes to our walk with Jesus when you feel on empty when you feel drained how quickly do you run to him and and, and don't be that person that waits till it's in total devastation and you finally go okay I'm gonna go to God No, in the midst of your brokenness, when Jesus is in the scene, you run to him. You run to worship. You run to your small group. You run to serving. You run to your quiet times because Jesus will meet you there in the midst of your brokenness. Can I hear a better amen today, church? Here's what Psalms tells us. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is so awesome to know that when you bring your brokenness to him, he will heal your brokenhearted. He will heal whatever is in shambles in your life. But you got to bring it to him. You're in church today. This is a perfect time for you to bring your brokenness to God and watch what he can do with it. Look how the story goes on. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha responded with the, with the religious answer. And this is so easy for us to do. We, we love to, to make something, you know, something far-fetched and theoretical. She goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I know he will rise in again in the resurrection of the last day. I know it eventually will be okay. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And then look what happens. Verse 32. 
when Mary reached the place, so Mary finally gets out of being frustrated and says, I guess I got to go meet Jesus out there. And Mary walks out to meet Jesus. And when she walks out to meet Jesus, what does she do? She fell down at his feet and said, I'm so glad you're here, Jesus. Is that what she said? No, she looks at him and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Isn't it crazy? It's the exact same statement her sister made. Isn't it funny how we'll say the same stuff and vent to each other all the time? And we're all, it's almost like they have been sitting there in their own pity party for four days saying the same stuff, talking about how angry they are with Jesus. And then finally, she comes and says, well, if you would have been here, listen, then this wouldn't have happened. I want you to know, I, I want to give you permission today to talk to God in a way that you might not have ever learned it's okay to talk to God. Here, here's what I want you to understand. Number two, when you're dealing with a broken heart, you can let your frustrations get pent up or you can vent it to Jesus. I love the fact that finally in our story that they come to the place where they're going, I'm going to take my frustrations and I'm going to give them to the one that can deal with it. So I don't know who you've been venting to or been angry with. Some of y'all have been venting on Facebook. That's a bad place to vent. Some of y'all are venting with your family. Bad place to vent. You vent to your spouse. And it's just negative, negative, negative. Can I give you permission? God can handle your venting. He can deal with your frustrations. One, some of my most incredible moments alone with God are those moments where I get before God in all rawness and realness and say, God, I'm angry right now. And to be honest, I'm a little angry with you. You go, we can't talk to God like that. Let me just say it this way. Jesus is attracted to your authenticity. Well, you want, you want God to get real with you? Start getting real with him. Start bringing your anger and your frustrations and your, 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 even your doubts. Bring them to God. Where else can we go with them but to him? I, I had a problem with my iPhone a couple weeks ago, and it stopped charging. I think I got too much water in there or something. And so it stopped charging. So I would have to like, it was like a miracle every time it would charge. Now, your iPhone might not, not have had the problem. If you're an Android person, uh, you need to get saved. All right, so. <laughs> but... It, <laughs> I would have to plug it into the port, but I would have to lay it at like a certain angle. You, you know what I'm talking about? Where like, and it would start to finally charge, and I'd be like, get away from it, get away from it, get away from it. So like, my kids would run in the room, and I'm like, don't get next to the table. It's charging, it's charging. It would finally charge, and then you bump it at all, it would stop charging. So I've probably told 12 people about how terrible and how frustrated I am about this iPhone. So finally, I was like, I wonder if I should tell Apple. Everybody else knows my problem. So I decided to drive to the mall and went to the Apple store. And, and they go, oh, yeah, we can get you an appointment. I got a little appointment. I told them the problem. And it's so funny because they didn't respond to the problem the way my friends did. <laughs> the way my friends is, I can't believe that. That should be working better like that. That's how my friends responded. You know what Apple did? Let me have the phone. Let me take it in the back for a little bit. They did a little magic on it. And then they brought out the phone. And they go, your phone's working fine. You can take it, Mr. Burke. I brought my problem to somebody that could actually fix the problem. Let me encourage some people here today. You're venting to the wrong people. Bring your brokenness to the one that can heal your brokenness. Jesus can handle it. There was a guy whose son was sick. He was, he was demon-possessed. They could not find freedom over his son. And they come, he comes to Jesus, and he's, he's just upset, and he's frustrated. They can't find freedom. And he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus responds to him. It's like, it was almost like a demeaning thing. Like, if you can probably do something, do something about this. And Jesus responds and says, if I can. If I, if you can. What do you mean, if you can? Like, I'm, I'm God. Of course I can he says, everything is possible for him who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, he says, I do believe. He goes, but help me overcome my unbelief. Amen. Look at the vulnerability in that statement right there. I, I want to believe something. I'm having a hard time. When's the last time you got before God and say, God, this doesn't make sense. This is frustrating for me. This doesn't, this, I, I need your help to believe in this situation. And I'm telling you, when you get real and you get vulnerable, watch how God will come and meet you in that place. So, so let me say it this way. When you are broken, don't try to impress God. Press into God. 
press into him. Bring it to him and watch what he can do. Our story concludes, and I think this is so crazy in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her while also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. He says in verse 34, he says, where have you laid them? He said, come and see, Lord. And then verse 35, Jesus wept. If you've never memorized a verse in the Bible your whole life, today you have memorized John eleven thirty-five. 35. Jesus wept right there. You can tell everybody and impress them with your biblical knowledge. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. By the way, I want you to understand this. This passage shows us God's heart towards brokenness in our world. People sit there and go, well, what does God think about this? God's heart breaks when our heart is broken. When, God, when he, that tragedy happened in Texas, God's heart's breaking. God's heart breaks with what he sees in, happening in Ukraine. He breaks with what is happening in your life right now. He, he weeps with us as we weep. And what does the verse say? Jesus, once more deeply moved, he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, take the stone away, he said. And when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine everybody sitting there? Today, everybody, everybody with their phones just like staring at it, right? <laughs> what is happening? And the dead man came out with his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen. This is the original thriller experience happening right there. And a cloth around his face. And what happens? Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. They thought it was over. They thought it could never be better than it was. But God stepped on to the scene. This is what happens with our brokenness. Number three, here's what you need to understand. When you have a broken heart, only Jesus can transform something broken into something that's beautiful. And I don't, I don't know why he lets things happen or why he allows things to happen. But I do know that every negative thing, every broken thing that has happened in my life, God can turn it into something that's beautiful. Beautiful. God can turn it into something that is amazing. You see, this is what happens in our world today. Our world specializes in breaking. And it'll break up the relationship and break up your hope and break up your, your, your dreams. It'll break everything up. But our God specializes in rebuilding. And he can rebuild what is broken. I've been praying this even over your life this last week, Isaiah 61. And it's giving the description of, of the, the, the commission of Jesus and the, the ministry of Jesus. It says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. If you're in a season of mourning right now, and whether it's mourning a loved one or mourning a job or mourning a diagnosis, God wants to bring you comfort today. And look what else he says. And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Yes. I know in your world you feel like it's just there's no way it's going to get better. And God says, no, watch how I make it beautiful. Amen. Watch how I can make it beautiful. And look what he says. The oil of joy instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. There is hope on the other side of your brokenness. You see, because this is what the world does. The world takes your brokenness and they said, oh, come on, try to piece it together. You can make it all work. You can make it all work. And you try to take your broken life and you try to fix it and you go, okay, I, can, I think this goes here. I don't know. It kind of ends up like this. And you're walking around going, I'm okay. <laughs> Great. Everything's fine. <laughs> it's not fine. It's not fine. You're sad. You're frustrated. So you're broken. About 700 years ago, there was a Japanese leader who um, his favorite teapot got broken, and he was so devastated by it. So he sent it off to China to get it repaired. It was gone for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally, it came back. And when it came back, the, the Chinese pottery people had taken it and just kind of stapled it together. And it, honestly, it looked kind of like this. It kind of looked like, okay. It's, it's, and he looked at it, and he goes, that's not the best we can do. There's no way that's the best we can come up with. 
So he commissioned some of his leaders in his, in his village, and he said, I want you to come up with a solution to this brokenness. And what they came up with has now been called, it's called kintsugi. And what kintsugi is, is it's a Japanese art of now taking broken pieces. And what they did is they took it and they put it together, and they put it together with gold. And it's actually the most beautiful thing. And it's very expensive, too. That's why we could only afford a little one like this. <laughs> and we're on a budget here at Radiant. And what it does is they take the broken pieces and they layer this, these brokenness with gold all throughout it. And what comes out afterwards is actually way more beautiful than what was even done way before it was broken. And I'm just believing over somebody's life today that this is the kind of miracle that our God does. That he's the God that doesn't take your brokenness and says, well, we'll piece it together, but it's never going to look great. He's the God of God that when he puts his stamp on it, and he puts his spirit in it, and he puts his purpose in it, it becomes more beautiful and more powerful and more priceless than you could ever imagine before. That's the God that we serve. Write it down this way. Because our mess in the hands of God becomes a masterpiece. Amen. So I know that brokenness you're dealing with. You go, it can't get better. It can get better in the hands of God. That relationship that you go, it's never going to resolve. Watch what happens when God gets his hands on it. You go, well, you don't understand. This diagnosis is so terrible. Watch what happens when our God gets involved in this situation. The greatest miracle of the New Testament outside of the resurrection of Jesus happened in John chapter 11. They brought their brokenness to Jesus. And Jesus, in one word, speaks into this situation and life comes back into it. I want to be your pastor for a second. I want to speak into whatever situation you're in and want you to know God can bring life back into it. God can bring hope back into it. God can bring purpose right back into it. Can you give them some praise today, church? Let's think about this passage here today. John chapter 11, when Martha, you got to put yourself in the people's shoes. Imagine this. Martha, sitting there in such anger, hurt, probably a little bit of offense. She hurt, hears Jesus is on the scene. What is her reaction? She comes out to Jesus and says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She got real with Jesus. She got real. But then this next verse popped out to me. And I, I don't know if I've ever seen this before. She says to him, in the midst of her brokenness, she says, but I know. And that's what I'm believing over you today. Get a little bit of faith there at Clearwater. A little bit of faith there in Brandon. To know something that you probably didn't know before. She says, but I know. And then she says these two words, even now. Can we say those two words out loud? Even now. Even now. Now, she says, even now, in the midst of four days in the grave, even now, if you speak it, something can happen. I'm going to encourage somebody today, you think it's all over and it's all dead and the purpose is gone. God would say to you now, even now, if God moves on your behalf, he can take what is broken and turn it around for the good. Can we give him a little bit of praise today, church? So why don't you do this? Why don't you stay in your feet at all of our campuses today? Why don't you have a moment right now where you, you, you make a decision today to be a Martha, to be a Martha to say, I'm not going to just stay in my brokenness any longer. I'm going to bring it to Jesus. I'm going to surrender it to him. I know some of you are dealing with real pain, real heartache, real frustrations. Come on, release it to Jesus right now. He's a God that even now can heal can mend, can repurpose, can rebuild all that the enemy has stolen and broken in your life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Come on, worship team, lead us out. So I throw up my hands and 
about to release those who are going to get baptized we just let the Holy Spirit start to do a deep work get that assurance right now that God is making something beautiful a masterpiece out of your mess out of your brokenness God we give you our brokenness we give you our our mess we give you our issues and we have faith to believe that even now you can do a work we trust you Every eye closed, every head bowed. There's another group that's here today at all of our campuses. And it's those that don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want you to know God loves you and he has a plan for your life. Your life is broken. You feel disconnected from God. How? It's because sin has come in. Sin separates us from God. Separates us from our purpose. Separates us from that relationship with him. So how do we get resolved? How do we heal that brokenness in our life? That's why Jesus came. He came to the earth died a horrific death for you and for me so that he could be the sacrifice for your sins and for mine now the decision is ours because he didn't stay in that grave he rose again he conquered gra- grave he conquered sin and now he gives you a choice will you give him your life and watch what he can do with it we've already had dozens make this decision today today's your day cross tampa bay you're here today and you go aaron i I'm not where I need to be with God, but I'm going to make a decision today to give Jesus my life. If that's you, on the count of three, I want you to throw that hand up. Wave it at me. Put it right back down. This is a big decision, a bold decision for you to say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. On the count of three, this is your day of salvation. Ready? One, two, three. Throw that hand up high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Dozens here at South Tampa. I know there's more that are watching right now at the Heights. Thank you. And Brandon, North Tampa, Clearwater. St. Pete, just throw the hand, throw it right back down. Why don't we all pray this prayer out loud together? Say, dear Jesus, come on, say it loud. Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I give you my brokenness. Forgive my past, my present, and my future. For the rest of my life, I'm going to follow you. Thank you for dying for me. I'm going to live for you. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that believes it says, come on, let's celebrate those who just made the best decision ever. Here's what you're going to do. 